Prefer your true crime in podcast form? Want to listen on your favorite podcast platform? This episode was also uploaded as a podcast episode. This content is not intended for children. No harm is intended to the people discussed in this episode or their families. This episode is for educational purposes only. Content warning. The subjects of this video are missing women. There are brief mentions of racial disparity. There are mentions of weight at the time of disappearance. Hello, and welcome to the first ever episode of A Memory of Malice. I'm Lenix. It's a very warm 112 degrees Fahrenheit right now in the Phoenix metro. With the fan off and the door closed for recording, I feel like I'm melting. But it's the perfect weather for me to start this journey with, so uh, I think let's go. I wanted to cover something important for my first ever episode, something that had to do with my home, with Arizona, so I chose these three cases of missing Native women, mostly because I couldn't find any major news media stories about them. So I wanted to add my voice to the chorus of other folks getting this information out there. While researching this, I came across a lot of horrifying statistics. According to the National Crime Information Center, Of the 5,712 reported cases of missing Indigenous women and girls in the U.S. in 2016, only 116 were entered into NamUs, which is the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. So, NamUs is an information database that is supposed to include missing persons information from all across the U.S. But if people can't be bothered to put the info in there, then folks searching the database never see it. So those that referenced that database in 2016 never even saw the information on 5,596 missing persons. The worst thing about these cases is the lack of momentum. They rarely get any media attention, which means there's not a lot of detail and virtually no public awareness. As much as the media can be a circus in big cases, in small ones it can be a lifeline getting photos and details out to potential witnesses. Luckily, there are YouTube videos and podcasts and blogs and a lot of websites doing hard work to try to get this information to everyone out there. And the hope is that, you know, someone somewhere might see or hear this episode or see the photos and realize that they know something. Like all the cases I'm going to cover today, there's very little to go on in this one. You probably already looked at the runtime, but this is going to be a short episode. There's just not a lot to go on. This first case actually has the most information of the three. Uncover.com, which is a crowdsourced missing persons database I found online, happened to have a lot of detail and source links for it. We'll start with Saley. First, an apology. I looked up how to say Saley online and got a lot of conflicting advice. I actually looked up how to say a lot of words for this episode. So if I mispronounce anything, I really did try. Anyway, Saley, Arizona, is a small census-designated place not far from the border of New Mexico. It's part of the Navajo Nation, and while it's home to the main campus of the Diné College, which is cool... Saley is only about six square miles and was home to only 1,205 people in 2010. It was here that Wilhelmina Whitewater disappeared. Wilhelmina, Mina, Denise Whitewater, was a member of the Navajo or Diné tribe. She left her home in Saley, Arizona on July 31, 2018. She gave every indication that she would be returning, but she disappeared. No contact has been made with her family or friends. Wilhelmina has black hair and brown eyes. She is 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighed 140 pounds at the time of her disappearance. She was wearing black pants and a black and white jacket with blue and purple running shoes. She had two rings on, but no description was given. Possibly they were an engagement and a wedding ring, but I don't even know if she was or had been married. And people wear rings all the time, so it's really hard to guess. She was 45 when she went missing, and she'd be 49 years old now. Okay, our next case takes place in Indian Wells, Arizona. 
Indian Wells is actually not too far from Salie. It's only the next county east. It's an unincorporated community in Navajo County. As of the 2010 census, 255 people live there. 255! Well, that included Lanaya Shabi. Lanaya Lynn Shabi disappeared on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2015. Try as I might, I couldn't find a last known location or any circumstances of her disappearance. This is very frustrating for me, because how are people supposed to know if they were in the right place to see something important if they don't know what that place was? Anyway, Lanaya was 5'10", and weighed from 140 to 145 pounds. Her hair and eyes were brown, and her ears appeared to be pierced. In several photos, she's also shown wearing a pair of glasses. I'm unsure whether those are reading glasses, or whether she was in the habit of wearing them all the time. She was 52 years old when she went missing, and would be 59 years old now. Alright, last case. Our last case for this video is that of Misty Rainey Bedany, who went missing while out with friends in Judito, Arizona. Judito lies about 24 miles away from Indian Wells. Like, you could get there in about 30 to 35 minutes. When I chose these cases, I didn't intend for all of them to be from the same area, other than the general area of Arizona. It was just a weird coincidence. Jadito is another CDP that is part of an exclave of the Navajo Nation. And it's only 5.6 square miles, and was home to 1,065 people as of the 2000 census. There are a few facts in this case I found repeated on several unofficial websites, but I'll include them with a warning that they may be false leads. I can't vouch for the accuracy of these sources, but I figure it can't hurt to give the information with that caveat. The information is as follows. Misty is a mother of four, of Navajo descent. When she was last seen, she was wearing a black shirt and blue jeans, and was carrying a bag of toiletries. Official records list that Misty had brown hair and eyes, and she was anywhere from 5'3 to 5'8 inches tall, and weighed anywhere from 157 to 160 pounds. At the time of her disappearance, she was 27 years old, and she would be 33 as of now. That's all I have for you today. You'll notice that all of these women disappeared from quite small communities. I know it's cliche, but someone must have seen something, even if they don't realize it. The key to solving these cases is to get the information out there. Don't let these women be forgotten. If you know a murdered or missing indigenous woman, or another case that you want me to do an episode on, or if you know one of the women in this episode and have more information I could add, or notice that I said something that was incorrect, please contact me at a memory of malice at gmail.com. I'd like to thank nativehope.org, Uncovered, NamUs, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Facebook page, the Charlie Project, and the Justice for Native People advocacy website for being indispensable resources to this episode. Also, Wikipedia actually gave me a lot of helpful statistical info about Saley, Indian Wells, and Judito. Those links are in the details. Thank you for listening to my first ever episode. It means a lot to me. Uh, if you would like to see more episodes um, coming, uh, please subscribe or rate and review. Uh, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, I'm at a memory of malice. Uh, stay safe and stay hydrated. It's pretty hot out here. <laughs>